I love these radio control models. These are EPP foam models, they're called Foamies, 400 millimeter wingspan. They're really easy to fly. They're considered trainer aircraft. You can have a lot of fun with them though, even if you're experienced. In this video, I give a simple guide to people who are just learning to fly how to operate these things. These are the Volantex and Sonic RC machines. RTF, that means ready to fly. Here is the RTF ready to fly transmitter that comes with the aircraft. It does the job fine. Now this is what's called a mode two transmitter. All that means is that the throttle control is on the left, mode one is on the right. This is a four channel aircraft, which means you can control throttle, ailerons, rudders and elevator. This is the throttle control. So as you move that stick up, you give the aircraft throttle down, the engine stops. You can stop it at 50%, 70% or 100% and it will stay there. It is the only control that doesn't self center. On the right hand stick, we have left and right aileron control. That controls the roll of the aircraft. That self centers. If you want to go left, you move it to the left. You can also move this stick down and up. If you move it down, the plane will climb upwards. If you move it up, the plane will dive. You also have rudder control or yaw. You move this stick left or right to yaw the plane left or right. Now when you first fly, I would suggest give it full throttle, some up elevator and launch in beginner mode. There are three modes there, go through that in a moment. Once you're airborne, just lower the throttle a touch and just fly around left and right on the right stick, up and down on the right stick. And that is the easiest way to begin. If you want to turn left, move the right stick to the left. You can increase your turn radius by yawing to the left as well. Some people add a touch of up elevator. You'll get the hang of it as you go. And the most important thing to do is get used to how the model performs when it's flying towards you because of course, left and right are reversed when it's flying towards you. Over time, you'll build up what's called muscle memory. Now it does have three modes, beginner, mid and expert. So what do they do? Well, it's currently in beginner mode. There is mid mode and there is expert mode. The plane is what's called X-Pilot, which is a form of stabilization and auto leveling. So in beginner mode, if you come off the sticks like that, the plane will auto level. Also, it has restricted movement on the ailerons and the elevators. So you cannot perform a manual loop or roll because the plane's movements are controlled quite a lot. This just smooths things out for beginners and makes it much easier to learn. There is another way though to do loops and rolls using the aerobatics button. We'll come on to that in a minute. Once you've mastered that, you can go on to mid mode. You'll find the plane is a lot more lively now because the authority is greater on the controls and you can actually do manual loops by pulling down on that stick, but you still can't do manual rolls unless you use the aerobatics button. If you go into expert mode, instead of having just the partial stability of mid mode, you now have none. The plane is completely in your hands. And I would suggest using that only on non-windy days. You have to be really expert to fly that in extremely gusty conditions. And it is a lot of fun, but I think it's also 
quite difficult. You can be fighting your aircraft more than you can be flying it because you're fighting the gustiness of the wind. So I tend to <coughs> prefer flying in mid or beginner mode and have some stability. Beginner mode is very easy. I can fly all day like that and it's low risk or no risk flying. This is the aerobatics button. You push that once and within the next five seconds it will expect a command from the right hand stick. If you move it left the plane will roll left. If you move it right it will roll right. If you pull it towards you or downwards the plane will perform a perfect loop and then auto level. It does that really really well. After it's performed that stunt you have control. The aircraft come with various spares, undercarriage and other prop, that sort of thing, but also a one cell LiPo battery, 400 milliamp hours. The transmitter, you'll need to supply four AA batteries for. I mark up my transmitters so I know which aircraft they belong to, although these transmitters can actually link to any aircraft. More on that in a little while, but I'm just going to show you how to power up these aircraft the normal way. This is the battery bay, or I call it a power pack. Now what you should do first is put your transmitter on it, a beep. You then plug this power pack in, it only goes in one way, I then level the plane. You can hear the stability functioning already because it's in beginner mode. And at the moment you need to bind it. You do that by moving the throttle stick up and down. And that is now bound. Now the next time I do it, it will throttle. So I now know I've got control. To stop it moving all the time, I often put it into expert mode because that has switched the stability off and that is what that noise is. Now how you put the batteries in is up to you. I tend to tuck them in like that. Then you need to get the wire in as well as you can. You don't want to damage that wire either. That just clips down. If that clip breaks you can replace it with a servo horn, just screw another one in. Now it's very important to put it into beginner mode again. Otherwise when you launch it might dive into the ground. Now it's possible to launch them in expert mode, it's just much more difficult. So that plane is now ready to fly. And you can see the self leveling happening as I turn it. Look at that aileron. It is moving to try and correct aircraft and make it self-level. Very clever technology that wasn't available a few years ago. It has a lot of thrust too, even though it's just a brushed motor. So that is how you bind the aircraft and then when you switch it off, what I do is hold it level so all of the controls are level, put it into expert mode, then I turn it upside down, carefully unplug that power pack and pull it out then turn the transmitter off and then immediately turn it into beginner mode again. By default I want to leave it in a stability mode if possible. Treat that connection very carefully. Treat the whole model as gently as you can. I number my cells so that I know which aircraft they've come from and how long I've had them. This is 1S, one cell, 3.7 volts, 400 milliamp hours. Now, a useful thing to get with these is a thing called a LiPo meter. And this measures the voltage. So I recently charged this power pack and if I plug it in, and you can only plug it in one way on the left hand side, it tells me that all of the cells are reading 4.1 volts and that cell 1, and it only has one cell, is 4.17. These LiPo meters you can buy online, eBay for example. Now why are they useful? Well I fly these power packs for 7 minutes 
and that takes them down to their perfect storage voltage of 3.8 volts for a LiPo battery and the battery will be quite happily stored like that for weeks if not months. If you run them right down, especially to under 3 volts, the battery may not survive and it can lose energy very quickly and then die. So they recommend a storage volt of 3.8 volts. When you charge them, they go up to 4.1, 4.2 volts, so you can check that they're charged batteries with this LiPo meter. And that's another reason why it's useful if you've got a few of these out in the field, you're not sure which ones are live and used and which ones are not, then you can check them. So I do recommend getting a LiPo meter, very inexpensive. They're also called LiPo alarms because they also have an alarm function, not something we use on these planes. So very useful stuff to get. Quick word about the props. I have a Spitfire prop here, but it's just to demonstrate things. They usually come with two or three bladed props, depending on the model. I find no difference at all in terms of performance or endurance or speed. If there is a difference, it is negligible. But I usually fly with a two-bladed prop because when the plane lands, especially if it hasn't got undercarriage, it's less likely to break a prop. Now, depending what aircraft it is, I may display it with the three-bladed prop. Now, these simply pop off because they've got prop savers there. If these become damaged, you can get replacement parts. In fact, the model should come with a replacement prop saver for the motor shaft and you'll know it's damaged because the proper keep flying off. In order to put it on you just locate it and clip it on. You should click into place, give it a little tug just to make sure it is on. Now I often display for example my Spitfire with a three bladed prop and I fly with the two. But the Mustang I fly and display with the two. That's all it comes with anyhow. Undercarriage is optional. Now these days I prefer the looks of the planes without the undercarriage so I don't fly with undercarriage but you might think as I did originally that that will protect the plane more having undercarriage and also if you want to do landings and takeoffs you need undercarriage. It depends what sort of surface you're taking off from. If it's concrete that is an option. If it's a grass field then undercarriage isn't going to help you with these particular planes. You just click the undercarriage in or some earlier models you have to screw it in. It doesn't make much difference at all if any I can't feel any to the flight characteristics of the plane but these days I fly without undercarriage. Now what made me change my mind? Well it was a Spitfire. I crashed a Spitfire at full speed into the ground at an angle like that. The undercarriage was on, the plane couldn't belly flop down and the nose split underneath about three quarters. I glued it again with Yoohoo glue, the glue that I normally use and within 10 minutes it was flying but it now has a nasty scar, the only plane of mine that does. I then saw my son crash a Spitfire in exactly the same manner but he wasn't flying with undercarriage and his plane just belly flopped down quite nicely. So that helped the plane actually survive. So Whereas the undercarriage may or may not protect the prop so much, it certainly can get in the way of protecting the nose, I've found. So now I don't fly with undercarriage. It's up to you though. What I'm going to demonstrate now is how the controls work. Of course, I'm not going to operate the throttle, but if I operate the your control, so that's the rudder left and right, now this is fully proportional, which means if I move a bit, it moves a bit. If I move more, it moves more. Nice. They're all proportional controls. This is the aileron control, left, right. And you can see if I move left, the left aileron moves up. Right, the right aileron moves up. And here is the elevator control. Now one thing you should take care of when you're finished with your model and you're carrying it home is that you don't knock the throttle. It's very easy to do. 
it has no throttle lock. So I would always suggest taking the power pack out of the plane so that that motor can't run anymore. The prop probably won't hurt you. It doesn't fly or move that fast to hurt you, this plane. And it only weighs 60 grams, very, very lightweight. So it comes under the 250 grams weight limit necessary for most authorities. They want you to pass an exam. But with planes like this, it really isn't that much of a problem because it's a nice little park flyer. It's easy for people to learn and it's less dangerous than someone who kicks a football around. The momentum in this model is extremely low. Now, just a few other things to mention. These planes do have a return to home function. You'll need to read the instructions on how to do that. But before you bind the aircraft, you've powered everything else up. You just move the, what's normally the throttle trim, you move that upwards. The plane will then twitch its rudder to show that return to home is enabled. Then when you're flying, after you've bound it and everything, you then move that throttle control, that throttle trim down, and the plane is meant to do 180 degrees turn. Mine do about 90 degrees. It's not a true return to home function. A plane doesn't know where it is in relation to the transmitter. And I don't think you really need it. So I won't worry about that too much. The other thing is you can get plenty of spare parts for these planes. Now the servo horn, the servo arms, you can get all of those for each plane, even spare servos. It is good to have a stock of props. Perhaps over time you might need other parts, but generally these planes are very resilient. The EPP foam is fairly flexible and pretty resistant, I've found. I also put my name and phone number underneath the plane. I've covered it up here, but that's so that if it goes in the garden, I have a chance of getting it returned to me. The other thing is important to note is that on the Mustang, this model, the Corsair and the Trojan, the first three, there are no hatches to get to the motor and gearbox or the servos and circuit board. Later models do have that and you just pop that out. That's really useful. But with these models, if you wanted to get into those components, you'd have to slip very carefully with a very sharp knife into the foam, separate them, get to them, and stick it together again. Now I found that never creates a perfect join afterwards. And that's why the inspection hatches are a nicer idea. Also the very latest model is the Zero currently. And that has a clear canopy, which is particularly nice. All the others have painted foam canopies. So they are improving these over time, I suppose. But even the older ones, such as this Mustang, look great. They have the lines of the aircraft and they fly superbly. I think they're an awful lot of fun. The Mustang is one of the closest to the original plane shape, although the fuselage is a little wide here. The P-40 is fairly accurate too, and the BF-109. The Zero, the Spitfire, the Corsair and the Trojan, they all have main wings that are set further back from the nose than the real plane. And they capture the lines of the real aircraft fine, but their proportions are a little bit off. They have to be so that the model can fly its centre of pressure as created by the wings is in a different place uh, to the real plane because the centre of gravity is in a different place to the real plane. The real planes have very heavy engines at the front, so the wings are nearer the front. Sometimes I repaint the models. I've done that with a Mustang and a P40. I use Tamiya acrylics or Vallejo paints that I can put into my airbrush. I've also used an acrylic spray can but I've just up to acrylics. I don't know if other paints will attack the foam. If you've got inspection hatches, you can take one off and spray the underneath, the inside of the inspection hatch first, just to see if the foam is attacked or not. I would always recommend 
having a little trial run first somewhere, but you can repaint these models. There are also ways to connect these models to multi-protocol transmitters. They sell bind and fly options, BNF options, and that's what that means. So if you've got your own transmitter, you don't have to buy this model with this transmitter. You can buy it slightly cheaper with just the plane and then connect it to your own bind and fly transmitter. The protocol is V761, I think. There are other videos around though that you have to check out if you want to see how to do that exactly. That's not something I do. For repairs to the plane, I glue any splits in the foam with Yoohoo contact adhesive. But for ailerons, a movable joint, I can glue those with Yoohoo POR, P-O-R. That's a flexible version of Yoohoo that will bend as that movement and that joint bends. Incidentally, you may wonder what happens to this plane if you go out of range, say the batteries in the transmitter go low, although I've had mine in there for a year. I change them every year. Well, what happens, you can actually try this out by holding the plane in your hand, giving it some gentle throttle and then switching the transmitter off. And what happens after a few seconds, the plane knows it's not getting signal. It just cuts power and lands. That is my view on how to fly these machines. I do think they're a lot of fun. I love them. So enjoy them yourself and have good flights.